This is a little taster session uh, in terms of looking at some research that has been done in Warwick, uh, including by uh, myself. Uh, uh, and you know, you know, there's lots and lots of examples of, of similar type of work coming out very regularly. So what is, what, is, what is it that economists actually do? Um, economics is all about the study of incentives and trade-offs. It's all about essentially figuring out how we individuals make choices and also how collectively as societies we make choices. Um, and it, in essence, provides you with a framework of thinking how to understand what is going on in the world, you know, how to make sense of, of, of the world. And modern economics research is particularly useful and important because it actually uses an incredibly wide range of methods. Um, and obviously, uh, over, the over the past decades, the toolkit has broadly expanded. How economists are approaching the study of economic phenomena has changed a lot. The raw material that we work with in terms of data, methods, and computational power has steadily increased. And what we do in Warwick is sort of enable and empower our students from the start to actually be co-researchers, to be part of the research journey because as, as universities, we are, we are, one of our roles is obviously to educate the next generation but also to build knowledge. And it's very important to enable the next generation to actually build that knowledge. Um, and so it's all about research. Uh, research is a vital part. So let me just tell you a little bit about how you know, modern, modern economists sort of uh, think about uh, sort of policy making, policy evaluation as one of the components of applied economics research. Um, if you think about sort of public sector faces a policy issue, for example, how to deal with uh, a sort of an emerging infectious disease, um, you know, there's lots and lots of things that might be going on and typically uh, in terms of policy making and policy evaluation, we would like to think that the process works something like this. There's a policy design or policy ideation stage where essentially lots and lots of minds come together to think about, okay, what is the policy problem at hand? There's then the policy implementation process um, which essentially involves the deployment of an active policy. Think about uh, uh, around the pandemic, you know, how do we roll out contact tracing or testing, right? Um, and obviously there's a policy evaluation process as well that says, well, look, we had this idea to deal with policy issue X, we've implemented it, and we've embedded a way of evaluating uh, um, the specific policy choice. Um, and thereby, obviously, we learn about what has worked and what has not worked and what we can improve. So this is essentially modern, modern sort of economics research being embedded into policy making and policy design process. Um, let me just give you a sense of how this looks uh, a little bit in the context of the pandemic, which is not that long ago, and we're obviously still, as a society, processing some of the things that have been going on. Um, very early on in, in, in the pandemic, economists have sort of coined what we would call the pandemic possibilities frontier, which essentially tells you, essentially the policy makers or societies, we face sort of a choice of navigating essentially a trade-off between saving lives and sort of saving livelihoods. Um, and of course, um, there's a trade-off because as we, for example, restrict certain high-risk activities at the start of the pandemic, when many things were unknown about the, about the actual disease, we didn't know what were the long-term implications, the short-term implications, there's a huge amount of lack of knowledge about key parameters of that disease. And that men meant it made sense to restrict certain economic activities that were more at risk of spreading the disease because the disease was yet unknown as to what it would be sort of in terms of the, the, the actual uh, health burden that it would, would come with. But obviously restricting certain economic activities that are high risk, think about hospitality sort of, uh, or even, even university lectures, right? Um, you know, do come at an economic cost, right? And so there's a trade off essentially between lives and livelihoods. Um, and this trade-off does appear in the data. Uh, if we look at, uh, on the vertical axis here, we have sort of a measure of the immediate economic impact of the pandemic in the first half year of 2020, measured as the drop in GDP on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, we had sort of the cumulative deaths uh, that were attributed to the disease um, up to like fall 2020. And what you see here is that there is sort of a gradient, a, a slope whereby essentially more deaths uh, are associated with a worse sort of contraction in GDP, right? But of course, we don't actually observe the full trade-off. We only observe every country's own realization on that possibilities frontier, right? So we don't observe the whole 
possible set of combinations that societies face, but we actually only observe a single data point, right? Um, and that highlights the importance of data. Now, we can be sort of on this point in terms of the trade-off, we can be sort of further inward, or the possibilities frontier can be shifted further outward, we, meaning we want to get to that bliss point of essentially no damage and no, uh, no harm, right, in terms of health, health losses. But some countries obviously face a very different trade-off. If you have a younger population, uh, um, you know, that was less susceptible to the disease uh, um, because less pre-existing conditions, that meant maybe in some African countries where essentially the populations are much younger, certain economic restrictions were not as relevant, uh, protecting lives uh, uh, versus livelihoods in some developing countries, that was a very tough choice because actually restricting the economy also meant that many people who live at subsistence in developing countries would then actually run into big problems in terms of uh, making, making ends meet on a daily basis, right? So we see that there's variation across countries. And of course, technology and our knowledge, as our knowledge developed over what this pandemic entails, meant that this trade-off was sort of shifted outwards. For example, through vaccinations, um, improved treatments, which essentially helped society navigate this trade-off more. So let's have a look a little bit at some research, um, because again, policy making is vital to shape this trade-off. So where, where is it that sort of, uh, you know, a country finds itself? Um, so I want to talk about two pieces of research that actually had a bit of, uh, you know, there was quite some, uh, brought sort of attention to this um, because it highlights a little bit sort of how the policy making process works, how the learning process works, and to what extent there is a good feedback and there's a healthy relationship between scientific advice, research advice, and sort of policy making, uh, um, um, which the pandemic has highlighted, but obviously over the past 10, 10, 15 years, there's been sort of a constant struggle a little bit between what is the role of experts in sort of giving advice or input to policy making. So, um, let me think about one policy that might have made things worse. Um, this is uh, drawing on the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. Now, can we get a hands up who participated or benefited from that scheme? So, a lot of people participated, right? Did you participate knowing that, well, not so sure whether we should be doing this, or is it really safe? Was it, you know... That, that's sort of a question, right, that sort of people are struggling with. Um, because, of course, the government said, well, it's okay, you can sort of eat out in restaurants and we subsidize this. And in total, um, there was about 160 million meals that were covered by this, by this scheme, which meant it was actually broadly taken up by many people. Um, the scheme implied a 50% discount on the eat out bills, um, from October, from uh, August 3rd to August 31st in 2020, it was only available, available Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, because there's an idea that you don't want to subsidize, you want to subsidize eating out on the days when restaurants are usually not as busy. Um, so let's have a look at what the data says, what that scheme did. Did it encourage take up? Yes. We see here on the left figure, sort of a year-on-year -year change in restaurant bookings over that time period, and you see here the red dots are sort of the eat out to help out days, so there's Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays during that peak. So you see there's a massive increase in uptake where people were packing into restaurants. What you also see, to a lesser extent, is the following. Actually, relative to the pre-period, restaurant visits were already normalizing. People were getting back into, you know, trying out some things in terms of what's safe, what's not safe. They were making individual choices, what's safe, what's not safe, what works for them. But you also see, actually, during the week, um, there's a bit of a shift of patterns of restaurant visits, where people essentially just shifted dining from the end of the week, from the weekends to early in the week when the subsidy, the discount was available. It's a rational response to sort of shift consumption into temporally if Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday eating out is cheaper than eating out on weekends. And so the question is, did that have an impact on the pandemic? How should we think about in terms of the public use of taxpayer money? Because this scheme cost about a billion pounds uh, uh, to deliver. Um, and sort of, is there any sort of, you know, health implications, health outcomes from this? The cool thing is, and let me say this here, in the UK we can do this type of research because actually the data plumbing was reasonably well done, as in we could get infection data in a very timely fashion, which means that almost 
you know, while the scheme was still running, I was sort of starting to code up the data, develop sort of the evaluation framework to study to what extent places that had a higher uptake of that program saw differential changes in infections, which obviously is sort of the first, you know, kind of prime component to looking at the health versus livelihood, lives versus livelihood trade-offs here. And what we see is, yeah, almost immediately with the onset of the scheme, which was sort of here indicated as the vertical line, we see that uptake is strongly correlated with more infections, but only during the weeks, uh, and in places where there's many restaurants that were participating in that scheme. So we see that uptake is strongly correlated with an increase in infections one week after the program started, which is about five days was the incubation period for the pandemic. Um, and that was at a time when a vaccination was in sight, uh, um, but uh, uh, you know, it was summer and, and so we were just coming out of the first wave of the pandemic. So over the program period, which is marked by these two vertical lines, we see there was a differential increase in infections that then resulted obviously in you know, essentially lifting up the possibilities frontier to the inward side because it was in causing more infections to be spread in particular more broadly and more widely spread out. Now you can say, still think that, well, maybe this is not a causal relationship, maybe places that have lots of restaurants were very different from the places that don't have lots of restaurants during the time when uh, the, 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 the program ran. Think about some places attracting potentially foreign tourists, right? And so it could have a differential effect in places that have more restaurants participating. So there's an alternative way that we can use satellite data or sort of high dimensional data to look at this question, which is by looking at what the great, lovely English summer does. It's awesome right now, but uh, um, obviously, uh, you know, there's some concerns around maybe it's too awesome in terms of, uh, think about the uh, implications of climate change. But what we can look at, exploit over this time period, is also the inclement weather. There was a lot of rainfall in some parts of England uh, on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays during the program, on, in some weeks when the program ran. And what we see is that the places where there was a lot of rainfall, during the lunch and dinner hours, when people would typically consider, should we you know, go out for, for, for a meal, we see that actually, um, the uh, restaurant visits are sh much lower during that program period uh, uh, when it was raining. And as a result, in these places where it was raining, we also see differential, uh, less infections in the subsequent waves. And this is one way that we can credibly establish causality that says, well, look, of course, the previous design that compares places with, that has more restaurants or less restaurants, you know, that already is quite something, but we can also triangulate this question differently by looking at, in this case, the inclement weather patterns and the fact that people just happen to not spend as much time outside when it rains, which means they're also less likely to visit, uh, visit restaurants. So this highlighted that essentially there was a public policy choice that was in essence uh, uh, sort of shifting us a little bit on the inside inward to the, to the pandemic possibilities frontier. And obviously it raises a question whether it was a good use of public funding, whether you know, people would have visited restaurants without the incentives, right? It's about sort of how do we deploy that billion pound, what would have, would have been there better alternative uses of that money, right? And that is what we as you know, uh, people as citizens, as taxpayers, you would ask yourself, but also as researchers, this is what we, what we think about. What is the counterfactual? What is the counterfactual policy? What could have been done? What is some policy alternatives? And that is obviously what is so important for this policy ideation design process, because this is how we collectively process and learn as a society. I want to sort of trace out another uh, uh, short paper that, that I did during the pandemic, which is looking a little bit at our society's plumbing in terms of the digital infrastructure. And we heard a lot about contact tracing, or you might have heard about contact tracing. You might have had a personal experience being contact traced. Um, um, and of course, as researchers, we want to know, does contact tracing actually work? Because of course, hundreds and hundreds of millions of public money were actually devoted to actually setting up a contact tracing system. Does it work? Well, as researchers, this is something that we would love to study, but it's something that in the ideal sense we would do with an experiment, right? Like a clinical trial where you sort of give a dosage of contact tracing, give less dosage of contact tracing, just as you evaluate like whether a medicine works. But of course, this is something that we cannot do for ethics reasons, right? Because it means that effectively somebody who is potentially a risk to others, um, you know, 
what does it mean giving that person less contact tracing, right? It means basically that person will not have his or her infection chains or potential contacts being investigated. That, what, that is what we would be doing if we were to do an actual experiment, but for ethics reasons, we can't do that. Here is where the life throws us what we call natural experiments. Just like the pandemic or the, the public, uh, the, the restaurant business was a, pan, was a, was a uh, natural experiment in encouraging eating out, right? Using taxpayer money to encourage eating out. We have another natural experiment here that resulted from essentially a elimination of contact tracing um, that happened by chance, by, by essentially an IT error. So here I've just showcased a little bit sort of how this works if, if for you to remember. If somebody gets tested and they test positive, you know, you would identify close contacts. Many people would have identified close contacts themselves if they found out that they, that they had been exposed. But there was also a centralized testing routine uh, and a contact tracing system that basically involved that once the test result was there, um, people you know, would be essentially asked to reveal close contacts and then there would be essentially somebody representing the Department of Health or Social Care issuing essentially a stay home order that you should, you know, should self-isolate. Now, what happened? Well, um, there was a blunder whereby in the plumbing of our societies, there was an Excel spreadsheet that was being used to transmit case information. Now, the biggest challenge with the pandemic was that many people don't understand nonlinear growth processes. So the fact that, you know, if you have exponential growth, things are really, you need to intervene before things get to worse. You know, when actually most people would say, well, we shouldn't be doing anything, nothing's happening around us. Um, but this is essentially the problem with exponential growth. You need to head it off very early. Um, and so what happened with, in, in, this, in this case is that case information was transmitted with a, with a binary Excel spreadsheet that was using a file format from the 80s, which in the 80s, processing power, you know, file sizes, like the formats were basically restrictive. And so um, there was only 64,000 rows in the sp spreadsheet that you could fill with data, and, you know, then it would sort of basically just say, well, I don't save any more rows of data. And so, in essence, what happened, thank you very much, what happened is that case information was just randomly lost. So instead of being submitted via the spreadsheet, it was added to the spreadsheet, but it couldn't save the spreadsheet because it was reaching its file size limits. And that resulted in about 16,000 cases of people who tested positive to not be referred to contact tracing, which meant in essence, it gives us a natural experiment through which we can say, well, if we know who these people are, where they live, we can see what happened to the pandemic in the places that had, by chance, because the files were not ordered in any way, it was sort of first in, first out, in terms of case information, these 16,000 cases are pretty much randomly scattered about. And so, in essence, what we do here is we look at that experiment because it basically meant for these 16,000 people, contact tracing was effectively turned off. This is how it looks across England. Uh, we see that uh, um, in terms of the, the data, um, we were able to discover this, that essentially there's a gap between the daily reported numbers um, and the numbers that later got corrected uh, because the 16,000 missing cases were people knew where they were, where they lived. Um, so we can actually break this down by local authority or sort of uh, local, local areas. So we see in some places they had more cases dropped from the Excel spreadsheet, which means in these places there was more people who were not contact traced, who had their close contacts not contact traced. Which means we can compare places that had more individuals not contact traced with places that had less individuals contact traced. It's like, you know, a high treatment, low treatment, like a high dosage treatment, a low dosage treatment if you evaluate like a medication. And what we see is the places that had an above median exposure to this, this data being lost, uh, individuals not being contact traced, eventually got propelled on a different pandemic trajectory. Um, so uh, uh, this is what is sort of displayed here visually. Uh, we see essentially the places that had more or less exposure to this contact tracing error. They were evolving roughly at the same point, at the same, same rate. So the pandemic was sort of progressing with similar new number of cases on a weekly basis, but then this contact tracing error essentially propelled the places that were more exposed into much higher kind of trajectory in terms of cases. And so we can estimate how many cases were essentially caused by 
the contact tracing system failing, which in essence involved people not staying at home or not being issued a formal stay at home uh, order, which if you get a phone call from somebody who represents the government, you might actually take this seriously. Otherwise, people were like, yeah, I can you know, probably sneak out for, for this and that. You know, I think some of this definitely did happen, just knowing human nature. Um, now, this particular error, uh, we estimate cost about 1,500 people's lives, and that's a conservative estimate. So it meant 1,500 people would not have died had it not been for the contact tracing error being operating as per, uh, as, as how it should be. And obviously this contact tracing system was built by some companies who got a lot of, you know, compensation for this, which meant, you know, this is some, some things that we need to look at as part of the, the, the public inquiry in COVID. How could this have happened? You know, where's the digital plumbing of our society so fragile that we send around files when in fact a lot of this exchange of information and data could be working much smoother, much, much more easy uh, um, by sort of having robust IT systems, which I think this is some work that I'm currently doing around the tackling the climate crisis is very much a similar issue. That a lot of the problems are the processes are very slow, data is not being shared, information is not being shared, and so getting from climate talks to climate action is very, very difficult. And this is recognized now at the policymakers around many countries um, that this has been a serious issue, and I think there's some movement happening, so that's a, that's a good sign. Just, just last week I was in the German Chancellery and sort of there was a meeting of economists where essentially we did a lot of sort of like fact-finding. You know, where is, where is the data that is missing to essentially make sure that we can move from, let's say, a narrative of, of we should be doing something about climate change to actually moving to climate action. And a lot of it has to do with improving the flows of data and the flows of information. Now, there could be a lot more said. Um, you know, I think um, economics is a great discipline. It's a great discipline because of the plurality of skills, the plurality of topics that we cover. A lot of this is basically public health related research. Um, um, but of course, we can frame it within economic setting because we were looking at this particular trade-off. So Warwick is a great place for studying economics. Uh, it goes without saying. Um, and for me, it's the really huge reward, you know, the next generation, right? And essentially instilling kind of how we work, how we think onto the next generation. Um, and uh, obviously, in, in all of that, research is a key component and a key guiding principle to our teaching, our evaluation, and how we think about sort of, yeah, shaping and creating sort of the next generation's leaders. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.